I have a heart and body defiled by many offenses, a mind and tongue over which I have not kept good watch. Therefore, O loving God, O awesome majesty, I turn in my misery, caught in my snares, to you the fountain of mercy, hastening to you for healing, flying to you for protection. And while I do not look forward to having you as judge, I long to have you as Savior. To you, O Lord, I display my wounds. To you I uncover my shame. I am aware of my many and great sins for which I fear, but I hope in your mercies, which are without number. Look upon me then with the eyes of mercy, Lord Jesus Christ, eternal King, God and man, crucified for mankind. Listen to me as I place my hope in you. Have pity on me, full of miseries and sins. You who never cease to let the fountain of compassion flow. Hail, O saving victim, offer for me and for the whole human race on the wood of the cross. Hail, O noble and precious blood flowing from the wounds of Jesus Christ, my crucified Lord, and wash away the sins of all the world. Remember, Lord, your creature, whom you redeemed by your blood. I am repentant of my sins. I desire to put right what I have done. Take for me, therefore, most merciful Father, all my iniquities and sins, so that purified in mind and body, I may worthily taste the Holy of Holies. And grant that this sacred foretaste of your body and blood, which thy, though unworthy, intend to receive, may be the remission of my sins, the perfect cleansing of my faults, the banishment of shameful faults, and the rebirth of right sentiments. And may it encourage a wholesome and effective performance of deeds pleasing to you, and be a most firm defense of body and soul against the snares of my enemies. My body will be here. Here. Hello. Okay, good. Anybody there? It's a mirage. <laughs> so tonight we're going to talk about the Mass. And for those of you who are um, anticipating a, you know, sort of like walkthrough, okay, this is practically step A, B, C, that's not really what it's going to be about tonight. That'll be another talk. So tonight I want to anchor uh, what we mean by the Mass in something larger, you know, right from the very beginning, from creation, uh, from the Old Testament, and sort of how we uh, enter the Mass as, as Christians. And, and St. Ambrose, who wrote that beautiful prayer before Mass, really touches on a lot of those points. You know, he talks about approaching God, being transformed by Him, receiving the Holy of Holies, for the purpose of then going out and transforming uh, and redeeming society, being a co-creator with God in a way. So that's really what this talk is about. I think another time we'll do a talk on sort of how the particulars of the liturgy we have now sort of correspond to what we'll talk about. So that'll be our, our sort of theme, so the meaning of the past. So right as we begin, uh, we have to get some definitions. Uh, these are words that we've heard before. What does the Mass mean as a definition? You know, when you say, let's go to Mass, what do we mean aside from you know, go and pray. What does the word mean? Does anybody know? Gathering? A group of people. Okay. A gathering. It actually comes from uh, about the 4th century, 397, St. Ambrose, uh, is when it first actually comes up in the literature. And it means, it comes from the last words of the Mass, ite misa es, which means go, you are sent. So, Mass, misa, uh, the sending forth is what you would do at the end of Mass. You would say, go forth, the Mass is ended. Glorifying the Lord by your life, or whatever the particular ending that the deacon or the priest chooses. Uh, but that's where that word comes from. So it's a sending forth after have, we have done something. What does the word liturgy mean? That's another common word. Does anybody know? Readings. What is it? Readings. Readings, okay. Eucharist, 
Does anybody know what Eucharist means? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, yes. <laughs> Thanksgiving. So I think the question for us is, what is the work that we're doing, that we're hoping to be accomplished? What is that public work of the Mass? What is that public work of Thanksgiving that we are being sent into the world to accomplish? That's what the Mass, that's what the Eucharist, that's what the liturgy is all about. It's not so much, it is, in a way, what we do at church, but it's also about a way of life. It's about an entire transformation, and we'll see this, you know. That makes sense. In order to do that, we have to go back to the beginning. You know, in order to understand what the Mass is, in order to understand the liturgy, in order to understand the Eucharist, we've got to go back to the very beginning. And so, who has Bibles here? I have my faithful cohort. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28. And let's see...
So the goal of all creation is the covenant rest. Let's read Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 and 3. 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all their array were completed. Since on the seventh day God was finished with the work he had been doing, he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had undertaken. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work he had done in creation. So that's the goal of creation, is that create the creator and creation itself would rest in an embrace. So what then is the original liturgy for man? What was the original work for man, right? Liturgy means work. So what was the original work for man? God creates and we create in a way, offering it all back to the Creator, surrendering our will and our life, bringing all things back to the Creator. The exitus of God, the exit, leads to the return to God. In the Sabbath rest, we become one with God, where God is all in all. The Sabbath was meant to be the meeting place. Okay. That makes sense? You're like, what does this have to do with mass? We'll get there. <laughs> so we messed it up, right? So we have the sad story of sin. Let's read Genesis 3, uh, verse 1 to 9. So we were meant to be this beautiful, cooperating with God and bringing things back to Him and having the Sabbath rest and giving divine life through our mediation to the created order and bringing it back to God, and we messed it up. Genesis 3, verse 1 to 9. Now the snake was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He asked the woman, Did God really say we shall not eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the snake, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, You shall not eat it or even touch it or else you will die. But the snake said to the woman, You certainly will not die. God knows well that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened like gods who know who know good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good food and pleasing to the eyes, and the tree was desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made loin cloths for themselves. When they heard the sound of the Lord God walking about in the garden, Yeah, that question, where are you? Where is Adam and Eve? Why does God ask? Whenever God asks a question in the scriptures, why does he do it? Because he's dumb? He doesn't know what's going on? Why does God ask that question, where are you? Because where is Adam? Where are Adam and Eve? They're nowhere, right? They were meant to be in a relationship with one another and all of creation and meant to be in union with God. And because rather than enter into that story, enter into the order that God has created, and bring it all back to God, to till it in the way that God gave the instruction manual, right? Eat this tree, eat from the fruit of this tree, have these animals do this. Instead, they say, I'm going to grasp it for myself, right? The serpent, who was the first one who said, I won't serve in the order that God has made. I want to replace God. You know, I want to be an autocrat. He thought God was a monad, one, one dictator, you know, to rule them all, by the way. And so that first contagion of, of sin from, from the serpent, from the devil, enters into the human race, enters into Adam and Eve, who rather than embracing God's vision, say, I want to grab the divine life. And you can't take the divine life, you have to receive it. And so they didn't trust God. And so Adam was meant to be the primordial priest, yet because of his failure, because he thought that he could grab at life rather than receive it, you know, where are you? He's actually cut off from being. He's cut off from God by his own choice, and all of creation is cut off from God. Because Adam and Eve are meant to be the apex of, create, of the created earth. They're able to give voice, we even say in the liturgy, we give voice to every creature under heaven. Right? Adam and Eve were meant to give voice to the material order, and to give that in union back to God. Does that make sense? Yes? No? Does it? Okay. So that's the sad story of sin. So we have this, at the very beginning, we see that the original liturgy, the original work, the, the Eucharist and the Mass all point to this, but the original work was to have this union of the human and the divine. 
and it was messed up due to sin. And all creation suffers because of it. God comes to the rescue, of course, and uh, we're going to skip over a lot of parts, you know, Genesis and all that, but I want to come to Exodus. Uh, because the Exodus event is interesting. There's really two reasons why Moses is sent to Pharaoh to lead the people out of Pharaoh into the promised land. There's land, obviously, is a reason to have a community, a place for them, which is symbolic of heaven, uh, but also right worship. They were meant to have both, that the land is ordered by a right relationship with God. And so worship gets relationship with God right so we can have the land properly. Worship is more than just the liturgy. The liturgy is meant to be the place where we encounter the transcendent God and are transformed and then can live properly. So the reason God calls Moses and the Israelites and creates that people is he's starting to uh, re renew what was lost by original sin. He's beginning to make right what was damaged by Adam's sin. He's saying, now I'm going to bring this community, I'm going to teach them how to worship, I'm going to show them who I am as the true God, I'm going to give them a type of worship which will foreshadow the worship of Jesus that, that we will celebrate in Jesus, so that they can come into contact with the divine life, be transformed by it, and live properly. Let's look at these, uh, Exodus 8 and 1. You know, a lot of people think Exodus is just about a political thing, they let my people go, but it's for the reason of worshiping God in the desert. The whole point of the Exodus event is worship so that they can inherit the land. So Exodus 8, 1. Yes. The Lord then spoke to Moses, speak to Aaron, search out, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams. This is Exodus 8, 1. it 
from looking toward God. Cult exists in order to communicate this vision and to give life in such a way that glory is given to God. So what happens in Israel, what God does for Israel is he shows them who he is. I am who I am. He gives them the Ten Commandments. He shows them how to live a right life. He gives them the temple worship. Right? Gives them the paradigm of that. So that they can begin to live a new kind of life. Again, the whole meaning of worship is that the human person goes back to that fundamental, original meaning of liturgy in the book of Genesis. Of offering their life and all of the created order back to God. And we see a pattern of this, a preliminary moment of this, in the life of Israel. Does that make sense? It's a stepping stone. We're almost there, but not yet. Right? So what's wrong with the work or the liturgy of the Old Testament? Didn't God command Moses and the rest to build the temple and to sacrifice animals? We think of Yom Kippur, we think of the sacrifice of the lamb, we even think of Passover, right? That last great event where where Moses, where Moses is instructed to sacrifice the lambs and the angel of death would pass over the homes, right? This, this, this feast that's you know, celebrated. God instructed them to do this. So what's wrong with it? Right? Let's look at some of the historical and prophetic literature. 1 Samuel 15, 22. But Samuel said, Does the Lord so delight in holocausts and sacrifices as an obedience to the command of the Lord. Obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission than the fat of rams. So we see a strand already in the Old Testament, that even after all of these sacrifices are instituted, what we see is that it's not enough, right? What happens here is a representation of what will be fulfilled in Christ. God uses Israel to give them right understanding, to show them how to worship properly, but it's not enough because it's representative, right? It's a shadow of the image that we'll have in Christ, which points to the reality that we'll have in heaven. And so we see that in 1 Samuel 15, 22, what God desires is not so much the sacrifice of bulls and goats. It's not like he's, you know, like Zeus going to take this, you know, and have a good night. The whole point of sacrifice is an obedient spirit. It's a sacrifice made of the heart that is made contrite for the Lord. Because again, the whole point of liturgy, the whole point of this whole this work is the union of the human person and God. And so God is beginning to show them, like a teacher through a divine pedagogy, that you're on your way, but the sacrifices of the Old Testament are not enough. It's not enough to take away sin. It's not enough to bring you into heaven. But you're on your way. You're beginning to understand the kind of thing that would be necessary, right? And in the Passover lamb, who do we see prefigured? Christ. Right, Jesus, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The lamb was a type which is fulfilled in Jesus. They're being taught to say, this is what has to happen, but a lamb can't do it. It's an animal. So there must be someone or something that can make what that image with that shadow is prefiguring. We think of Abraham in the book of Genesis, right? He was ready to sacrifice his son. The son through whom all generations that he was promised would come about. And he was willing to do that because God commanded it. And the angel of the Lord said, don't do it. And what did the angel of the Lord say? God himself will provide the sacrifice. And that strand of providing the sacrifice follows all the way through to Jesus. Jesus is the sacrifice. Jesus is the one who fulfills the work if you want to bring it together. Let's look at Hosea 6.6. 6. For it is loyalty that I desire, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Right. So he desires knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now for a Jew, you know, what does this mean? You know, they realize what they're doing is not enough. Let's look at Psalm 50. Verse 12 to 14. Are I hungry? I would not tell you. For mine is the world and all that fills it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Or for praise as your sacrifice to God, 
fulfill your vows to the Most High. So God is very clearly saying through the, through the lips of David, the psalmist, what? That he's not eating the flesh that's offered. Right? So the sacrifices of the old law are not sufficient. From the old law themselves, from the testimony of the, of the, of the prophets and the historical books. Let's look at Amos 5, 25-7. We just read that today in our... Not today, but we read from that book today. He's got the most five, twenty-five, twenty-seven. Did you bring me sacrifices and great offerings for forty years in the desert, O house of Israel? Yet you will carry away Suku, your king, and Kaiwan, your star image, your god that you have made for yourselves. <coughs> and as I exile you beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. And then Matthew nine thirteen. New Testament. Go and learn the meaning of the words, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. Right, so Jesus is pointing to this strand that's not in the New Testament. He's saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. What is mercy but the sacrifice of one's heart? And then Matthew 12, 7. If you knew what this meant, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have to be deadly for this event. Right. Oh, no. i got to go back to the beginning. So that's where we are. So we recognize that the Old Testament is a type, not a, not a completion, right? So then in the fullness of time, we come to Jesus, right? This is also from Spirit of the Liturgy, page 48. He says, the idea of the sacrifice of the Logos, which means Word, becomes a full reality only in the Logos Incarnatus. The Word was made flesh and draws all flesh into the glorification of God. When that happens, the Logos is more than just the meaning behind and above things. Now he himself has entered into flesh, has become bodily. He takes up into himself our sufferings and hopes, all the yearnings of creation, and bears it to God. The two themes that Psalm 50 could not reconcile, the two themes that throughout the Old Testament keep running toward one another, now converge. The idea of a need for sacrifice, of redemption, but the old sacrifice is not being enough. Those are the two themes. The word is no longer just the representation of something else, of what is bodily, like the, like the lamb. In Jesus' self-surrender on the cross, the word is united with the entire reality of human life and suffering. Jesus is like us in all things but sin. There is no longer a replacement cult, which is what the Old Testament was. Now the vicarious sacrifice of Jesus takes us up and leads us into that likeness with God, that transformation into love, which is only true adoration. In virtue of Jesus' cross and resurrection, the Eucharist is the meeting point of all the lines that lead from the Old Covenant, indeed from the whole of man's religious history, even from the beginning. Here at last is right worship, ever longed for and yet surpassing our powers, adoration in spirit and in truth. The torn curtain of the temple is the tur curtain torn between the world and the countenance of God. In the pierced heart of the crucified, God's own heart is opened up. Here we see who God is and what he is like. Heaven is no longer locked up. God has stepped out of his hiddenness. That is why St. John sums up both the meaning of the cross and the nature of the new worship of God in the mysterious promise made through the prophet Zechariah. They shall look upon him whom they have pierced. So all of the Old Testament sacrifices, which have this kind of presentation of an anticipation of a model, of a shadow, are fulfilled in Jesus, who is the Word made flesh, right? God becoming man is able to do what we were not able to do from the beginning. Adam 
who was meant to offer creation back to God because he said no to God's order, no to God's invitation, that all was ruptured. And some sort of satisfaction, there has to be some sort of atonement, there has to be some sort of redemption, and this idea of giving one's life a representation sort of sacrifice is not enough, as we see in the Old Testament. But then God enters into history in the person of Jesus and offers his own life on the cross. That's the work of Jesus. And that's the work of the Mass. And that's what we do at Mass. We get it Does that make sense? Has anybody thought of the Mass that way before? This idea of entering into... So Jesus comes to do the liturgy or the work right, that Adam was no longer able to do, that we're no longer able to do. We can't bring creation back to God because creation and humanity are ruptured. Right? We were meant to have God's life and to order and till and be fruitful and multiply. And we said no to God. We had our own little designs and sin enters the world. Right? So Christ comes to do what we can't do. In Christ, we can return back to God and bring creation with us so that God can be all in all. That's what that means, God can be all in all. That we are able to bring God's divine life into all the structures of society and all the structures of the world. In our, in our children, in our marriages, in our family relationships, in our workplaces, in culture, in society. That God is meant to be permeated. That's one of the big themes of the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council. That God is brought into the world so that the world can then be offered to God. So liturgy is not isolated. It's not meant to just be we go to church for 45 minutes or an hour and then we go about our life. Right? Liturgy is meant to be an encounter with God to learn and be transformed by Him. As Moses' face shone, right? When Moses went up Mount Sinai, his face shone. He had to wear a veil, right? Because he was, a, he was afraid that people would be um, concerned about him, you know? And so his, he, he, we're meant to be divinized and to bring all creation into the Sabbath rest. Does that make sense? So, Jesus does this the night before he died, right? What is the work of Jesus that we participate in at Mass? It's not a trick question. What's the work we participate in, right? When Jesus made a table, made with a saucer, is that the work we participate in? What is the work that we participate in? The Last Supper. The Last Supper, okay. But not, when we're at Mass, we're not really at the Last Supper. Where, where are we? What does the Last Supper point to? Bread and wine. What, what, yeah, so what, is that, what does that point to? It points to, he did it on Holy Thursday. The night before he died, Jesus did what? He anticipated... Yeah, yeah, he anticipated his death, and his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. Right? So in the Mass, we sacramentally anticipate. We, we are brought to the moment of the work of Jesus, right? The liturgy of Jesus. Jesus is the one who performs the liturgy. We don't perform the liturgy. We don't go to Mass. We don't create it. We don't design it. It's not our work. It's Jesus' work. Right? We enter into His work. We're joined to His life. We learn from Him. We receive life from Him. We're joined to Him, and then we go out, ite misa est, into society to bring His life to all the world, and we bring it back at the next Mass we go to, right? Our entire life offered on the path bread and the wine. That's symbolic of all of creation. We bring it back to God. God gives it to us himself. And the cycle continues until the coming of the Lord. The parousia, the, the eschatological, definitive, eternal Sunday. Right? The eternal covenant rest. Either by our own death or the second coming. Right? Because we're all heading toward the divine coming of Jesus. Toward the second coming of the, when he will come to Jesus the living the dead. But that second coming is when all things will be fulfilled. So what sacraments we anticipated at the Last Supper is Jesus' cross, right? Jesus says at the, at the Last Supper, you know, this is my body given up for you. And this, you know, is the chalice of my blood which will be poured out for you. Right? Do this in memory of me. He, he institutionalizes, he memorializes it so that we can be made present to that work. We can be at the foot of the cross. That's what the Mass is. 
the East talks about how we're brought up into heaven. That's true, but in the West, we always focus on the, the cross, the crucifixion. Because that is the work of Jesus where he conquers death and offers us new life. The union of the divine and the human are made possible by the cross. So we have a moment in history. We have a moment in the present where we participate in Mass. And then we have an entryway into the future. So let's look at that. Page 54. The word semel, uh, once for all, which the epistle to the Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews 8, 6, emphasizes so vigorously in contrast to the multitude of repeated sacrifices in the Old Covenant, is strictly applicable to them. But if they were no more than facts in the past, like all the dates we learn in history books, then there could be nothing contemporary about them. In the end, they would remain beyond our reach. So what Ratzinger is talking about here is that if the Mass happened once and for all in the past, how would we grab it today? In the end, they would remain beyond our reach. However, the exterior act of being crucified is accompanied by an interior act of self-giving. The body is given for you. No one takes my life from me, says the Lord in St. John's Gospel, but I lay it down of my own accord. This act of giving is in no way just a spiritual occurrence. It is a spiritual act that takes up the bodily into itself, that embraces the whole of man. Indeed, it is at the same time an act of the Son. So what Ratzinger is saying here is that this is not just a spiritual occurrence, but that it's an act which transcends time, which is able to be made possible today through the inclusion of your own flesh in the act of Jesus' self offering that because we share his human nature, he's like us in all things, but since we share his human nature, we can participate in the Mass by allowing his act of laying down his life to take up residence in our flesh. The real interior act, though it does not exist without the exterior, transcends time. But since it comes from time, time can again and again be brought into it. That is how we can become contemporary with the past events of salvation. So the interior act of Jesus, because he is alive, because he's living, because he's effective, that interior act of Jesus is able to be made present in our time, even though he spoke those words once and for all 2,000 years ago. That once and for all event is always present through time and space, because it's a spiritual act which can take residence in our own time. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Hello? So the liturgy is not about sacrificing of animals, of a something that is ultimately alien to me. The liturgy is founded on the passion endured by a man who with his eye reaches into the mystery of the living God himself by the man who is the Son. So it can never be a mere axio liturgica. Its origin also bears within its future the sense of that representation, vicarious sacrifice, takes up into itself those whom it represents. It, does not, it is not external to them, but a shaping influence on them. So being contemporary with the past of Christ in the liturgy of the church is also, in fact, an anthropological reality. The celebration is not just a rite, a liturgical game. It's meant to indeed be a logic of worship. The logic logicizing of my existence my interior contemporaneity with the self-giving of Christ. His self-giving is meant to become mine so that I become contemporary with the past of Christ and assimilated unto God. That's why in the early church martyr was regarded as a real Eucharistic celebration. The most extreme actualization of the Christians being a contemporary with Christ, of being united with Him. So we see that it's about my offering with Jesus, that we in a sense become contemporaries with Jesus in this time, in this moment, at Mass. Not when we sing some ditty, right? But when we actually unite ourselves to Jesus who is sacrificed for us, who lays down his life for us. That's what real participation of the liturgy means. It doesn't mean I sing Amazing Grace. It means I lay down my life with Jesus on the path. I offer my life to him. That's what sacrifice means. Sacrifice doesn't mean that I offer some bull. Right? We go back to the original meaning of sacrifice in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis. It's the ordering of my life. It's the giving of my life. It's the surrendering of my life 
to God. I couldn't do that because of sin. And God fixes it by giving me a human nature regenerated by his life that makes it possible that I can enter into his human nature and offer my life with him in the Mass. That's what we do at Mass. And that's why the early church, they continue, they, they speak about martyrdom as a supreme act of Eucharistic actualization right, in the person's life. That what happened in Jesus' flesh happens in our flesh too. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like a marriage. We'll get there. But yeah, that's exactly. Marriage is a lot to do. That makes sense? Oh. <laughs> so, this sacrifice is only complete when the world has become the place of love, as St. Augustine says in The City of God. That's a great book. Uh, only then, as we said at the beginning, is worship perfected and what happened on Golgotha completed. So Golgotha is complete in a sense because of Jesus' sacrifice, but it's not complete in you. Right? You're meant to lay down your life. With, because again, it's about that covenantal rest. You and your human nature are meant to offer your life with Jesus who makes it possible that you can enter into this new kind of life. That is why in the petitions for acceptance, we pray that the representation become a reality and take hold of us. That's why in the prayers of the Roman canon, we unite ourselves with the great men who offer sacrifice at the dawn of history, Abel, Melchizedek, and Abraham. They set out toward the Christ who was to come. They were anticipations of Christ, or as the fathers say, types of Christ. Even his predecessors were able to enter into the contemporaneous with him that we beg for ourselves. So we see that Christ transcends time even for those who were in the past to him, were types of him, that they were trying to offer the right sacrifice. And so even in the Roman canon, we pray that those types of sacrifice, which find the fulfillment of Christ, that we may find the fulfillment in them too by our offering of our lives. So it's tempting to say that this third dimension of liturgy, its suspension between the cross of Christ and our living entry with him who suffered vicariously for us and wants to become one with us, expresses its moral demands. Without doubt, Christian worship does contain a moral demand, but it goes much farther than mere moralism. The Lord has gone before us. He's our pioneer. He's our captain. He has already done what we have to do. He has opened a way that we ourselves could not have pioneered because our powers do not extend to building a bridge to God. He himself became that bridge. And now the challenge is to allow ourselves to be taken up into his being for mankind. To let ourselves be embraced by his open arms, which draw us to himself. He, the Holy One, hallows us with the holiness that none of us could ever give ourselves. We are incorporated into the great historical process by which the world moves toward the fulfillment of God being all in all. What does that mean, God being all in all? But that God transforms your flesh. That's the whole point. And you bring your whole created world, you bring everything in your life to God. That everything in your world, your little world, and my world, and your world, and your world, is so transformed that God becomes all in all. That's the meaning of that phrase. Right? So it has a moral dimension. That Christ who comes to meet us, who offers us the way back to the Father, who shows us how to live our life, gives us the capacity to do it in the does that make sense? Christ then is able to unite all things to himself in his humanity and surrender to that God upon the cross. This surrender allows all people to be drawn up into the covenantal rest of God, the Sabbath rest. It's all meant, it's all leading back to that eternal Sunday, that new life of the kingdom. That's what heaven is. It's resting with God. That's why Sunday is sort of like how we should calculate our time. It's too bad Sunday anymore. It's like a you know, bonus day on the weekend. But Sunday is meant to be that moment where we say, this is an anticipation of heaven. Sacrifice is not about destruction, but surrender. You know, even in the Old Testament, there was that idea of replacement sacrifice. They knew that this sacrifice wasn't enough. A bull can't take away my sins. Only thing that can take away my sins is my complete immersion into God's life, which I couldn't get on my own. I can't grasp it on my own. So we insert ourselves into the surrender of Christ and so find life, not death. 
The whole reason Jesus died is so that we might have life. You know, some people look at the cross and the mass and they say, well, there's an angry, you know, God the Father who demanded the death of His Son. That's not what it's about at all. The whole reason Jesus died is so that we might have life. He laid down His life that we might have life. Because God loves us. It's not about an angry God who wants justice. It's about a loving God who offers His life that we might be included into His human nature and be united back to God. Which was the whole point from the beginning that Adam and Eve screwed up. Eve screwed up. No. <laughs> um, all right, we do what Adam was supposed to do, but was unable to do because of sin. And so we anticipate the eschatological rest of the eternal Sunday, which our Sunday celebrations are meant to anticipate. That eternal Sunday, the eternal now, the, the day of the Lord. So, meaning of the Mass. This is a great book. We should have studied this book. So we saw that at our own time, the time of the church, we were in the middle stage of the movement between history. So the curtain of the temple has been torn, right, by Jesus' sacrifice. Heaven has been opened by the union of man and Jesus, and thus all human existence with the living God. But this new openness is only mediated by the signs of salvation. So we need mediation. Right? It's not like, oh, Jesus came, he tore the temple open, now we can, you know, worship on our own. As we do not yet see the Lord as he is, if we put the two three-part processes together, the historical and the liturgical, it becomes clear that the liturgy gives precise expression to this historical situation. It expresses the betweenness of the time of images in which we now find ourselves. So the theology of the liturgy is in a special way symbolic theology, a theology of symbols, which, which connects us to what is present but is hidden. So what, what Ratzinger is saying here is that because we are not yet in the new life of heaven, in the new heavens and the new earth, God's presence is mediated to us through symbols, is mediated to us through the liturgy, but it's different from before. You know, in the Old Testament, it was, a, it was a shadow. It wasn't even participating in it. What we have now is a participation in the image. It's real worship. It's real sacrifice. What happens on the altar of Mass is real. It's a participation in the cross, but it's veiled through sacramental signs because we're not yet seeing God face to face by the light of, by the light of glory. And so until we cross that threshold into death, our experience of God has to be mediated through symbolic signs, through signs. Does that make sense? So in so saying, we finally discover the answer to the question that we started. After the tearing of the temple curtain and opening up the heart of God and the pierced heart of the crucified, do we still need sacred space, sacred time, mediating symbols? Yes, we do need them. Precisely so that through the image, through the sign, we learn to see the openness of heaven. We need to give them the capacity we need them to give us the capacity to live the mystery of God in the pierced heart of the crucified. Christian liturgy is no longer replacement worship, but the coming of the representative redeemer to us, an entry into his representation that is an entry into reality itself. We do indeed anticipate the heavenly liturgy, but this participation is mediated through earthly signs, which the redeemer has shown us as the place where his reality is to be found. In liturgical celebration, there's a kind of turning around of the exodus to reditus, a departure return of God's descent to our ascent. The liturgy is the means by which earthly time, our time, is inserted into the time of Jesus and into its present. It is the turning point in the process of redemption. The shepherd takes the lost sheep onto his shoulders and carries him home. That's why the liturgy has symbols. That's why we use incense. That's why we use candles. That's why we use Latin. That's why we have a particular structure. Because it's not just a meeting between buds. It's a higher, hieratic experience of encountering the transcendent God. You see what I mean? And so we need those symbols, right? Uh, Mother Teresa used to say, or you know, a Muslim, I think, said, that, well, probably not true, but it makes sense. Everything is important. Where, you know, a Muslim supposedly said to Mother Teresa, you know, if I believed what you Christians believe about the Eucharist, I would crawl on my hands and knees to receive it. And yet how flippant are we often when we receive communion? Because we're bodily creatures, we need symbols, right? 
And sometimes in our modern sense, we say, oh, you know, we just, we're so modern, we just have to see right through everything. And we forget that behind all the symbols of the Mass is God. And so the symbols are there to remind us, like children, to say, you know what, we can't fully understand this. That's why we need Latin to sort of shake us out of our routine. That's why we need incense to remind us that we're encountering the mystery. That's why we need candles. That's why we need singing and chanting. Because it's not a normal experience of life. We're encountering God. We're entering into His work. It's not my work. It's not something I design. When we design liturgy, it's the golden calf. Right? It becomes turning in on ourselves, looking at everybody, clap, clap, how wonderful we are. Worship is meant to be God who comes to us. I want you to worship me this way. And we're changed by it. And that's what sacrifice is. It's saying, I surrender my life. Sacrifice shouldn't be fun. Right? If it's fun, we're probably doing it wrong. Right? Sacrifice is about offering everything back to God. And that's the path of the cross. So we need this image of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the meaning of the Mass. All right, we'll get into a little bit here, and then I'll end. We're almost done. There's really two acts in the Mass that we have it today, even from the beginning, you know, the early church. There's the Word and the Eucharist. So we have the liturgy of the Word, so the work of the Word. And what does the work of the Word do? It teaches us. It informs us. Right? When we go to Mass, what do we do when we're hearing God's Word? Hopefully we're all thinking, what we got to get the grocery store. Hopefully we're listening to what God has to say to us. What does God's logos have to say to my mind so that I can live a certain way? It's about being transformed into God's likeness that I can be a co-creator with Him in transforming the world and then bringing it back to Him. And the second work, the second act, is the liturgy of the Eucharist or the work of the Eucharist. And what do we do with the liturgy of the Eucharist? It's, whose work is it? It's Jesus' work. Who's, whose work is the liturgy of the Word? It's Jesus' work, right? It's not our work. We're there. What does it mean to participate? Not that everybody's you know, bouncing around doing something. Participation means we let ourselves be formed interiorly. That's what active participation means. Because not everybody can be the deacon, not everybody can be the officer, not everybody can be the reader, not everybody can you know, dance, be a liturgical dancer, right? We have to be interiorly formed. That's what that means. So the liturgy of the Eucharist is God's work, Jesus' work, it is the work of his cross. His self-surrender to God, and we insert our humanity into that self-surrender, giving our lives to God. And what does God give us in return? When we give our lives to Him, when we give Him the bread and wine, which is symbolic of the whole created order, right? The bread and the wine, which is symbolic of, of our lives, of our blood, sweat, and tears, of everything that we have to bring to God that's placed on that pattern. We say, I'm going to give this to you, Lord. I'm giving you my life. I'm surrendering it to you. What does God give us in return? Himself in the Eucharist. And then when we receive Him in Holy Communion, we receive a fruit of that sacrifice to strengthen us. So that for what reason? Ite misa es. To go out into the world to transform society, to then bring it back to God in the Eucharist. So we bring all creation to God and He gives Himself to us in the Eucharist. We bring God into ourselves and are sent out into the world to be the anointed ones. You know, that's what, you know, the Messiah means anointed. When we're baptized, we're anointed priest, prophet, and king. You know, we don't want to be spoiled little brats. You know, we receive the divine inheritance, we've got to live it. So we're the anointed ones who are meant to do what? To transform, to till the soil of the world. How do we do that? How do you do that? How do you, how do you, fulfill, how do you be fruitful and multiply? How do you till the soil? How do you have dominion? Like some dictator? No, like Jesus. He shows us the way. Uh, liturgy informs the life. There's an old, there's an old thing. Uh, lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. The law of prayer is the law of life. Is the, law, the law of belief is the law of life. How we pray reflects what we believe. What we believe reflects how we live. And you wonder why society is in such a shambles. It's because our prayers all screwed up these days. So we don't know what we believe. That's why 70% of people don't believe in the Eucharist anymore. Because we're not praying right. Right? Because of how we have those symbols. Uh, law of belief. And so if we don't believe properly, we don't live properly. So we anticipate a new heavens and a new earth. Which we already have a foretaste here and now by the down payment of the Holy Spirit. So we pray at every Mass that we might become transformed 
into what we receive, right? In anticipation of the future. We enter into the prayer of Jesus himself, his offering to the Father, and in our sacrifice of our will and life to his, we find communion with God possible. We find that rest, deification, is possible. So the whole point of the Mass is doing what Adam is supposed to do. Christ does it for us. We enter into his dynamism. We enter into his life. We offer our life with him. We are deified. We are divinized. And then we go out into the world to do what he wants us to do, what he himself did. Go and proclaim the gospel, the good news. That's what the Mass is about. And you can't get this in Box Church. <laughs> you can't get this anywhere else because it's got to be Jesus' work. It can't be a rock band with a 45-minute TED Talk. Fine, you can have a great talk on the Bible, you can have a great music experience, have a blast. But it's not real worship. It's not prayer. Because it's not Jesus' work. Does that make sense? Is that what you thought this talk was going? <laughs> You're like, okay, now this is what the curia means. This is what the gloria means. No. We'll do that in another talk, maybe. But I wanted to I wanted to anchor what is the meaning of the mass from God's intention. You know, from the very beginning. What did God mean for the mass? And how does Jesus do the work for us? Was this helpful? Was this something that was interesting? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So when you go to Mass, it's very cosmic, isn't it? It's not like, you know, it's very cosmic. Very important. Questions? Yes, Margaret. You're talking about this thing. How do the water first come? Who was the first, or how did that all get? How did the order? Yeah, the water of the mass. How did that all get done? Well, the, yeah. In the early church, we have the very basics. You know, you have um, uh, Saint Ignatius who talks about the order of mass. You have the Didache, which is an early document of the, of the church, which talks about the sort of form of the mass. It's very similar. So we have the we have the two acts of, of the word and the Eucharist. So that's sort of always been part of the the matrix, if you will. But we have to remember that the the Holy Spirit is given by the church and is given to the church and those who have who are entrusted with the gift of the liturgy it developed over time so for instance in the early church they would receive communion in the hand but it was they would receive communion in the hand for instance uh, very carefully you know you have some of the uh, uh, I think it's St. Cyril of Alexandria who talks about receiving communion in the hand and making sure not even a speck would fall it's like gold dust. You wouldn't let gold fall from your hands. In the same way, you have to be very careful. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they determine that it's best to receive on the tongue, right? Because that's part of the truth. It's part of this guidance of the Holy Spirit of deepening, right? We know more about how Jesus is both God and man than the early church because of the way that, that, that questions came up, the way that certain discussions came up, the way councils handled things, that the Holy Spirit is able to guide them in all truth to help them to deepen their understanding. So that's kind of how the Mass too developed. That what was in the beginning in, in sort of a, a nation in, in, in an implicit form is made more explicit as we have a deeper theology of the Eucharist, a deeper theology of work and of liturgy, of seeing how the, the synagogue worship and, and the Passover understanding moved over into the Eucharist. So they had more time to reflect under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so we see the Mass developing. There was a, a great codification of the Mass uh, after, the, after the Protestant revolt. Reformation, the revolt, really. uh, they, the, the church wanted to have a very, because Luther did not believe that it was a sacrifice. You know, he wanted to have everybody face everybody and have you know some you know, worship of, of ourselves. Get rid of the sacrifice, get rid of the Eucharist, just have a you know, Bible talk, right? The word is what's important. And just everything is a symbol. So he, he, he rooted out the, the, nest, the idea of sacrifice and of entering into the mystery of Jesus' self-offering. And so... You know, when that happened, the church said we have to focus on sacrifice. And so you have this, what they call the Tridentine Mass, so the extraordinary form. It came about in the 1500s, where that Mass was very, um, it showed very, very powerfully that what's happening here is a sacrifice. The only difference is in the manner of offering it, it's in an unbloody way. You know, and then that had pretty much stayed in place for 500 years until the Second Vatican Council, where there were some changes uh, to the Mass as a 
we don't. Does that make sense? But a lot of the things we have in history, so like the first Eucharistic prayer comes from the 4th century. So it's a very early um, ways of doing liturgy. So there's the like Eastern Rite churches, there's Melkite, there's Byzantine, there's Coptic. So there's a lot of different ways the Eastern churches, how they celebrate the divine liturgy of John Chrysostom. So, um, but they all have the same sort of elements of word and Spouses, you know, husband and wife, man and woman come before, 
they both lay down their lives, and there's a union that becomes one. And that's sort of what happens at Mass, right? That God comes to meet us, we come to meet God. God lays down His life in the cross, we lay down our lives, in that we have a union of persons. And we have the capacity to do that, because God has done it for us in Jesus. And by our baptism, we are made capable of doing that. <coughs> And the Mass provides us with His Word and His body and wine, body and blood. And yeah, so, so, so it's two tables, right? The table of the Word, the table of the Eucharist. So the Word is meant to form our minds, to give us instruction, to remind us of who we are. God's speaking to us, and then we receive His very life in the Eucharist. There were some ideas after the Second Vatican Council that the Word and the Eucharist were equal. Right? We should move the altar over here, or move the pulpit over here, or maybe just get rid of the tabernacle altogether, throw it in some you know, corner room. But the Eucharist is the preeminent place of God because He's present physically, but faithful. Does that make sense? Anything else? Urge. Is that it? So, I, so all right, keep it coming. I'm only until eight fifteen, so. So the, so the mass is central. Though, sorry, why, sorry, sorry. Why is the mass central? Why is the mass central? To what? A, a religion. Why is it so central? Because it's where you meet God. You can meet God on the beach. You can meet God in the woods. You can meet God in a book. You can meet God in you know, this person right next to you. But you meet God uniquely, truly, substantially at Mass. It's at Mass that we are able to encounter God in a, in a unique and totally irrefutable way. That God comes to be us, that heaven breaks into our time. God speaks to us. That's why reading the scriptures at home is not like hearing them at Mass. Hearing them at Mass, that's why a deacon is the only one who can proclaim you, the, uh, the, the gospel, because it's Jesus speaking. He's using the instrumentality of the deacon's voice. So at Mass, we hear God's word in a unique way, if we're listening, you know, if we're not thinking about whatever we're doing. And with the Eucharist, we're able to receive. So that's why it's called the source of the summit. Right? It's the source. It's where we, we derive all of our life, all of our energy, all of our relationship with God. It's the summit because we bring everything back to that point. Because it's his work that we enter into. Yes, Tim. Well, can you comment on how we can bring back the sense of the sacred? Because I think we've lost that a lot. Well, it's tough, you know. I mean, we're like children. And, uh, it's, you know, this whole idea is just scratching the surface. And people don't want to take the time to really understand what's happening. They want to be titillated, you know. I, mean, I was a kid once, too, you know. And I don't want to be dealing with having to understand represented sacrifice and, and laying down my life and surrender. I just want to go and have a good time. But, you know, that's not what sacrifice is. It's not what worship is. It's not what being formed by God is. You know, it's never fun to be told you're not living a good life. Right? But Jesus came to tell us the truth so that we can be transformed. He gives us his life in the Eucharist and we can actually make that happen. So I think the reason why we see a loss of the sacred is because a lot of, you know, a lot of priests and a lot of people want to be appealing. You know, and they want to make it easy. And in trying to make it easy and bringing everything to the lowest common denominator, <coughs> we actually banalize the liturgy. Pope Benedict talks about that a lot. That we banalize what is supposed to be sacred and we don't lift people up. You know, we sort of meet people in the gutter, we never lift them up, and uh, that's the issue. So how do we restore that? I think just by doing what the church expects. You know, following the rubrics, receiving the liturgy as a gift, not thinking we own it, right? I know many priests who think they own the liturgy, they make it up as they go along, they're a big entertainer. Mm -hmm. They're not an entertainer, they're, they're representing Christ in the Eucharist, and that's what they should be doing. So I think that's one way to do it. Just everybody understands their role and, and what the Mass is. 
Education is key. Yes? So I, don't know, I don't know if this is something you're going to be able to necessarily answer, but maybe more of a comment. When we do like the, I mean, I went to Catholic school and learned all of this, but this was something that was never really communicated as deep. I mean, I, I know it can't be always communicated as deep as, as it was tonight, but why isn't this part of our like learning as we're growing up? Because this uh, this here was very. Now when I go to mass on Sunday, I'm going to be oh, okay. This I'll is why you. we're doing all these things. Berkeley, I'll tell you, uh, I have been in priests who tell me that you know when they're doing the prayer at mass, the opening prayer, the the, the uh, prayer after communion. Those are prayers, by the way, that are meant. They're spoken to God, to God the Father. They're not, you know, so interesting that you know we, we say, let us pray, and we look at each other. You know, we should be, you know, all looking to God. But you know, in the Eucharist, in, in, in the Tabernacle, or toward the East, we could talk about that another time. But there are priests who say, you know, why does this prayer say, you know, let your people, you know, such and such and such? They say, why am I not included in that prayer? I want to be included in that prayer. I said to this priest, I said, do you have any clue that? You're representing Christ and speaking to the Father. Like the prayer is about, yes, the people, but you're forgetting your role. You know, it's not that you're all included with the people, that there's a mediation that's happening. So I think to go to your point, you know, why is this not presented? I dare say that, you know, some of the priests who were formed in the 70s and the 80s just didn't get it. You know, the liturgy became this act of coming together of just being in one another's company and trying to remember what kind of Jesus did. You know, this stuff was there, but it wasn't always presented in the same way. And I won't ask what Catholic school you went to. Uh, but, you know, Catholic schools, you know, I'll say these even recorded, I don't care. They're not the greatest. I mean, they, you know, they need a lot of work. You know, so. Well, it's just, it's like, if we're, if, and now we can teach our children, like, yeah. this is the reason why we're coming here. And, and it, it makes it more, it makes it more special, I, yeah. I want to say. And, Absolutely. You know, you, you, you know, you, I want to take like more time to to listen more intently to what you're saying, to what's being said. Yeah. You know, because it makes it, it there's a reason for us going, not just because we're told to go to mass every right. Sunday since I was a kid. Yeah, I mean, it's a place where you meet God. And you can like you, that's one thing there that's never. It's not really communicated that. I mean, it's an easy. I mean, it's very simple. What you just said. You know, I mean, that I I never was communicated that through all my. You know, teaching. I don't know if it was necessarily done because of the a lot of it is knowledge, but I think. It, <coughs> but I think if that was something that, and like I said, this is part of one of the piece that you really can't answer. But if that could be put into like the catechism and stuff like that to, to change that to make that because I think that would be a more powerful thing than just saying go to church on Sunday. You know, go to, don't miss mass when it's, it's a sin. But, this is the reason why. I mean, that's why, you know, the third commandment, keep holy the Sabbath, the whole reason for it is not because God needs us there. And I've said this in preaching, God needs us there, it's because we need it. And God knows we need it. And that's why it's a commandment. Because if we don't go to Mass, we don't receive His Word, we don't receive His Eucharist, what happens to our life? Lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi, everything falls apart. You know, if you're not hearing God's Word and not receiving His life, you're not going to believe properly, your life is going to go to hell. In this life and in the next. So, God knows that's why we need it. Why we need it. And it takes some getting used to. People who are away from Mass for a while, so they're like, oh, i got to get into this routine. But then you begin to see things more clearly. And you, you, uh, you know, you're able to. And read the book. I mean, we got the internet today. I mean, Spirit of Liturgy. You know, it's, a, it's kind of a tough book, but, you know, it's a couple hundred pages. Read it. You'll get something out of it. When this was written by, because uh, I missed the first one, this was written by Pope Benedict. Joseph Ratzinger, he wrote it in the 60s. 60s, yeah. Mm -hmm. He wrote it as a sort of memory of Romano Bordini, uh, who also wrote a book by the same title. Fulton mm -hmm. Sheen wrote a nice book, too, on the last. More practical. There's a lot of good stuff out there. You, can, you look on YouTube, you can watch Fulton Sheen, you know. He's a bit dated, but he's good. You know, he even talks about the Mass and how we give our life, you know, it's, it's all out there. You know, rather than watch, you know, 
traffic stops going bad. <laughs> Watch Fulton Machine once in a while, you know? I mean, I'm on, I'm on Facebook sometimes, and I'm like, what is this? Like, some creation of Plato? Like, what is that, you know? For, for a time when you think that church is very buttoned up, it's like 50s, 60s, but you watch him, he's very entertaining and he's very funny, I guess, as now that Catholic media is becoming expanded, yeah. he's definitely like at the forefront of that with T television. Another good one, too, is Bishop Barron, you know, and he's a good one. And, you know, we have that clock of the word on fire, if you, if you go on the website, you can actually access all his stuff. He has a great program on the Mass, and he really walks through. He doesn't do this, but he walks through all the steps of the Mass, you know, from the procession in all the way to the end. And he sort of goes through, it's like five hours, you know, each, each episode is an hour. So, you know, in between whatever you're watching on Netflix. Throw that in his penance, okay? Yeah. All right, well, thank you for coming. Let's end with um, the prayer. So now you see the, the prayer of St. Ambrose uh, that we started with um, beautifully gives us that idea of approaching God, being transformed, and going on. Um, this is the prayer of St. Thomas Aquinas after Mass. Okay? He says, I give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, who have been pleased to nourish me, a sinner and, unwor and your unworthy servant, with the precious body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, this through no merits of mine, but due solely to the graciousness of your mercy. And I pray that this Holy Communion may not be for me an offense to be punished, but a saving plea for forgiveness. May it be for me the armor of faith and the shield of goodwill. May it cancel my faults, destroy concupiscence and carnal passion, increase charity and patience, humility and obedience, and all the virtues. May it be a firm defense against the snares of all my enemies, both visible and invisible, the complete calming of my impulses, both of the flesh and of the spirit, a firm adherence to you, the only true God, and the joyful completion of my life's course. And I beseech you to lead me a sinner to that banquet beyond all telling, where with your Son and the Holy Spirit you are the true light of your saints, fullness of satisfied desire, eternal gladness, consummate delight and perfect happiness through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming.